Aloha and welcome to the Two Wheel Revolution here on thinktechhawaii.com. We are uh, discussing micro mobility, which is a fancy way of saying pretty much getting around everywhere you can except with a car. And it includes um, obviously bicycles and uh, electric bikes now. It includes uh, scooters of various kinds, e, e kick scooters. It includes motorized skateboards, uh, some with one wheel, some with two wheels, three wheels, four wheels. And uh, it, in my world, it, call, it includes things like walking and even wheelchairs, which we're gonna be talking about over the course of the show. But today we're very fortunate to have the uh, uh, executive director of the, of the Hawaii Bicycling League, a venerable inst institution here in Hawaii. He's uh, relatively new and yet not so new. And so Travis Council, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Peter. Happy to be here. Great. So first of all, you recently uh, completed the Honolulu Century Ride, and uh, this was the 39th annual, except, of course, you didn't have one for the last couple of years. So how did it go? Yeah, so just this past weekend, we had a little over a thousand riders out for the 39th annual uh, Honolulu Century Ride, um, and it was great. Like you said, we haven't had this since 2019, um, which uh, was a bit of a, a celebration to have people back in person. And I think there was a lot of a lot of positive energy, uh, people that were really excited to be out there. We had great weather, uh, a lot of support, over 200 volunteers that helped make this event happen. So. Um, really a, a strong celebration of cycling and, and ultimately a big fundraiser for our organization as well. So, Great. Uh, this was the first time you've ever done this uh, bus and bike uh, arrangement. How did that go? Yeah, so this was a fun option where folks could ride to the 50 mile mark uh, or technically the 100 mile turnaround. So half the course and then catch a ride back to Kapiolani Park, back to the finish area. Uh, and so really be able to see the whole course um, you know, but only have to ride half the distance. So it went well. I, you know, this was a little bit of a test run this year. Uh, we had about, I think, 16 or 17 people take advantage of it. Not a huge number, um, but enough that showed interest uh, that we'll likely do it again in the future. Just again, to give people some options to, to see a different route. Terrific. Over a thousand cyclists, you say? Yeah, 1,049, if, I, if my math was correct. All right. Very good. We won't ask who those last 49 were. So uh, you've been here in Hawaii before. You've worked for Hawaii Bicycle League before, uh, but now you're back as the executive director. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, and how you got to this moment. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I started working for Hawaii Bicycle League in 2013 uh, when we moved out to Hawaii, actually for my wife's uh, PhD program. Uh, and she actually ran into the then executive director on the bus. Uh, they were both riding and Ultimately, I was offered a job to, to work here as the membership coordinator and ultimately events director. So I have experience putting on the Honolulu Century Ride previously. Um, I then went off, uh, got my master's degree, uh, and also uh, ultimately opened my own bike shop in Waikiki. The pandemic hit. Uh, we moved back to the mainland for a couple different jobs that, that brought us closer to where we grew up. Uh, and then ultimately, Hawaii pulled us back. My wife got a job uh, back out here. And Unfortunately, uh, Lori, the, the most recent executive director, was, was moving on at that point, and it, this job became available. So uh, bikes have always been a part of my both career, but also personal life. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be back at HBL uh, with you know, previous knowledge, but also the knowledge I've gained since working here uh, and, and kind of you know, recovering, if you will, from the COVID time and really seeing where we can take this organization uh, in the near future. You ran a sort of a, a bicycle association on the mainland most recently, is that right? Yeah, correct. I, I worked for the New England Mountain Bike Association, so a large member-based organization um, similar to HBL, but really focused on, on mountain bikes. Um, and it had 32 chapters across all of New England, so quite a number of people in logistics and uh, you know, it was, a, it was a great opportunity to learn a little bit more on the nonprofit side, you know, executive director of that nonprofit as well, uh, and then to bring that back to HBL um, and ultimately hopefully expand HBL to, to focus on other, you know, types of riders, whether it's mountain biking or, you know, BMX or other things like that, the larger community. Okay. Just for the record now, how many bicycles do you have? <laughs> People ask me this a lot. Uh, I think I have eight uh, bicycles currently. One of every flavor. I've had more than that at times, 
uh, but uh, currently I believe it's eight. <laughs> and uh, what your favorite is the uh, the tricycle? No, no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which one is your favorite? Uh, I have I have a fun uh, bike that I built up from from a frame that uh, is my like commuter grocery getter. It's got lights that are built into it and kind of a big basket on the front. You know what I take to the beach to go drink coffee in the morning kind of thing. So All that right. would definitely be my favorite. <laughs> Very good. And just for the record, also, I'm assuming at this stage, none of them are electric. Uh, I do not personally. My wife has an electric bike um, uh, that we use kind of as a car replacement. Uh, we only have one car between the two of us. So she rides that to work fairly regularly. And, and we've talked many times about getting a second electric bike to ideally leave the car at home. All right. So uh, you've come back to HBL. Uh, how long has it been now? It's been five months, six months? Yeah, yeah. Came back uh, uh, as executive director in, in May and then full time. Uh, in, in later in June, so we just moved back uh, in June. So how's the how's the organization doing? Uh, give us a quick idea. I don't think anybody has a full grasp of all the things HBL does. I went on the website yesterday and discovered uh, senior biking classes on recumbents, which I had not even had a clue about. Now I'm going to have to sign up. So tell, give us an idea of what the organization does and how you're doing right now. Yeah, that's a great question. So we have kind of three main focuses at HBL. Um, we have our events, you know, like the Honolulu Century Ride and the Metric Century Ride on the North Shore and a bunch of smaller events. Um, we have the education, which you just mentioned as well, which is, you know, everything from our bike ed program, which teaches uh, fourth graders, over, over 8,000 fourth graders every year. That's been going on for almost 35 years at this point. Um, all the way up to the senior cycling, where we keep people active, even in, in older ages. And uh, everything in between, adult learn to ride. So our education uh, has a lot of grant components to that. And then our advocacy is kind of the, the other pillar of, of HBL. So where we work with the city, we work with the state, advocate for better bike lanes, bike facilities, changes in policies and laws. Um, so we kind of have those three main event, uh, main focuses, advocacy, education, and events. Um, and as far as how HBL is doing, you know, we, we certainly are uh, you know, in, back in a growth stage, you know, in the sense I feel like during COVID, we were in that maintenance mode, like most small nonprofits, small organizations, uh, really just trying to, to, you know, button down the hatches and, and, uh, and, and make it through. We weren't able to have some of those big fundraisers. So uh, we have an awesome core team uh, of four full-time individuals and then a, a number of part-time individuals who help. So we're definitely growing back out uh, and uh, excited to, to be able to get back in person and, and kind of, you know, uh, start, start the organization uh, going strong again. A lot of locales seem to have seen a growth in, in general uh, personal mobility or uh, whatever during the last couple of years. People didn't want to be on buses necessarily, uh, didn't want to be in public in mass transit. Uh, did we have the same sort of thing happen here? Yeah, I think we saw, you know, there was definitely a bicycle boom uh, across, you know, probably the world, but definitely the U.S. and, and especially in Hawaii as well. You know, we uh, saw whether it was people that already had a bike in their garage and they got it fixed up to use more or uh, went out and bought a new one. And I think, as you mentioned it earlier in the show, the, that, that kind of new, uh, new technology, whether it's the scooters or uh, small electric bikes or uh, those types of, you know, maybe non-traditional uh, two-wheeled devices or one-wheeled devices, um, we're seeing those pop up a lot more. Um, and I think, you know, Hawaii is definitely ripe for that. We, we have a lot of traffic, a lot of congestion, uh, and kind of that last mile or last couple mile uh, option for these uh, devices, really, I think we're seeing that popularity grow. And, you know, it's always seemed to me, Hawaii, people say two things. First of all, uh, can't ride, not safe. Uh, secondly, uh, Hawaii is a great place to cycle. And uh, I think that's true up to a point, certainly recreationally and for fun, but uh, in terms of commuting or, or uh, uh, the kind of, of uh, daily business riding that you would, daily life riding that you'd see in Europe, uh, it's hot. You get places sweaty and, and so forth. And so it seems to me, and I've said this before many times, electric bicycles are kind of the next revolution in what's happening with, with cycling. How do you see it? I think I, I definitely share that mentality. I was fortunate enough to take several trips to Europe and, and visit cities to look at kind of how they did it. I think uh, they were 
much further along when it came to electric bikes, primarily for the commuting aspect, like you just mentioned, where you can yeah. commute in business clothes, or even business casual clothes and, and arrive at work, not sweaty uh, and still uh, get there without a vehicle. Um, so I think the e-bike or the you know electric assist devices are certainly going to play a role into that. I think there's uh, an advocacy component as well of uh, having more workplace, you know, whether it's showers or changing facilities or uh, areas where those that commute not by car or you know something like that can can change and uh, and and be able to you know not have that impact their their ability to to ride their bike to work. Um, and, uh, you know, e-bikes are probably an easier solution in the current moment, but work on work from both ends. I see. And it, what, what else do you see is coming in the future and the kind of big picture of things? I just got back from the Micromobility America show in, uh, in San Francisco and actually in Richmond in, a, the old, in an old restored Ford factory where they once made Jeeps and tanks for World War II. And it was quite awesome. And there were some incredible uh, devices there and, and uh, a lot of discussion about the future of this kind of thing. So what do you see specifically for Honolulu? What do you see happening uh, yeah, I, in the future? Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think the interesting thing is that it's, it's likely not going to be a, you know, a one device you know, that takes over. I think we're gonna continue to see this wide variety of uh, electric bikes, you know, the scooters, which I know are very popular in a lot of mainland cities, um, and kind of those personal devices that really help, um, you know, make it so that it's easier to move around um, without relying on a car. I, I think that there's one big component to that, and that's infrastructure and making sure that, as you mentioned earlier, that it's actually safe to do this. And that there's not a barrier uh, or a perceived barrier even that, that prevents people from doing it. Um, I think we are seeing a lot of people that maybe even a year or three years ago weren't even thinking about it, I think we're seeing them, you know, starting to look at that uh, as a better option, especially as things get more expensive and uh, congestion returns to where it was with, with our visitors returning and things of that sort. Um, so, yeah. So uh, when you talk about advocacy, the first thing that usually comes to mind is infrastructure. What do you see the, are the advocacy uh, goals or, or needs for uh, bicycling in Hawaii right now? Yeah, I think there's a variety. I think there's, uh, usually when I talk about advocacy, there's kind of the, the three E's, or sorry, the three, three different pieces. There's kind of the infrastructure piece of it. There's the education component of it, which whether that's you know, what we do with uh, in, you know, educating people how to commute, how to, how to ride bikes places, or on the other side, educating drivers about how to be safer on the road and, and make sure. And then there's the enforcement side. You know, there's a lot of uh, traffic violations and, <laughs> and dangerous maneuvers, distracted drivers, et cetera, et cetera, that do uh, unfortunately make our roads less safe. So I think there's kind of the multiple different pieces there. Infrastructure one being one of the uh, you know, more, most important in my opinion, but also kind of somewhat hard to do. Uh, we can't really, we don't have a ton more space for it. So it is a little bit of a, this, this you know, competing for, for priorities there. But um, yeah, if you focus on all three of them, I think we can certainly see a, a good, uh, improvement. When uh, you mentioned enforcement, you mentioned drivers, uh, which I think is very important. As everybody at Micromobility said, it's not the, the micromobility devices that are unsafe, but the, the 10,000 pound cars that are, are unsafe. Uh, but uh, doesn't really matter if the person who doesn't get on one doesn't feel safe. But uh, there's also, I think, an enforcement question about people who are on their two-wheel devices. Uh, how, how do you deal with that? Uh, you know, the hot doggers, uh, uh, the people who just either don't know or don't care or think, you know, they're they're invincible. Uh, there's an invisible plastic shield or shield that's protecting yeah. them from these, mod, you know, monoliths that are driving around. Yeah, I, I think that that ultimately boils down to kind of a community effort uh, and leading by example uh, and making sure that people around you see you, uh, you know, behaving on, on bikes and, and other micro mobility devices. I think HBL plays a role in that. We do, you know, provide education, uh, even paper literature, pay, you know, education out to the bike shops and new riders and groups like that. I think, unfortunately, there's, there's always that small group that, you know, regardless uh, is probably not going to follow the rules, but hopefully we can make that as, as minimally impactful as, as possible. Um, I do think that, you know, 
uh, we often get that complaint from drivers that we, you know, we see people running red lights on bikes and things like that. And I think we stand out more than, than your fellow drivers, et cetera, et cetera, just because we, we might be more visible. We might be a little bit different than the crowd out there. Um, but I don't think that there's actually more people, you know, uh, breaking the rules or anything like that on these. I think that just is more noticeable, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think when you're driving and another car cuts you off, uh, you <laughs> or pulls in front of you, you kind of curse under your breath. But that's what happens when you're driving. If it happens to be a, a a person on a bicycle who who pulls in front of you and you have to stop, oh my God, it's it's uh, you know it's a, it's yeah. some kind of travesty. Oh, sorry. That's probably not a good word. Uh, it's some kind of an awful thing, uh, but you know that's because we're not used to living in a society where, uh, like the Netherlands or or others, where you know people know to look for bikes because they ride them, their grandmother and their children ride them, uh, and they just know that that's part of of what you have to do to get everybody to get along. And uh, on the infrastructure side, uh, it seems to me, uh, since you were here a few years ago, there has been substantial improvement uh, in, in some areas. Uh, there's certainly a lot more bike lanes, some of them actually separated uh, than there were, I don't know when you exactly when you were here before, but two or three years ago, you, you wouldn't have seen quite so much. Yeah, yeah, I think that the city has really taken a, a hold of when there's an opportunity when they repave a road when they you know either change lane striping or anything to really emphasize that complete streets mentality uh you know adding bike lanes adding improved pedestrian walkways etc cetera, etc cetera, you know which which i think is a great opportunity whenever a road is repaved or in some places improved in general you know widened or anything like that to yeah. add it's often quite a minimal cost, uh, additional cost to, to improve it for vulnerable users or people that aren't in a vehicle. Um, and, and I think we're seeing that a lot from, from both the city uh, and, and the state um, in, in a new, number of places. That's great. I just, uh, do you have any idea where the likely incumbent governor, the new governor, uh, stands on all those things? I mean, he, she's a, he should be a health nut. He should be uh, yeah, yeah. on our team, right? I'm, I'm hopeful that, that uh, you know, to work with whoever's in that position, but I, I do hope that, that we are able to, to kind of whoever emphasize that, that, uh, that healthy living. I think the transportation, you know, equality, uh, you know, when I look at projects like extending the, the King Street protected bike lane over into Kalihi, making it accessible for more and more people that might not even already have access to a car, just making it uh, more accessible. Um, and I think, you know, on the infrastructure, especially those, the real focus right now is the, the missing connections. We're starting to get a lot of patchwork of good infrastructure, like you mentioned, protected bike lanes and, uh, and, and off street paths, but they all kind of, you know, there, there's a little bit of space in between all of them that could really use those, you know, bridges or connections to, to make it much more of a network. And that's what we're really emphasizing with the city and state to focus on those connections and make sure that these these are usable. It'd be like a highway that ends in a field. You know, it wouldn't, would, you could drive there, but it wouldn't be very, you know, useful. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have useful bike networks. Yeah, you come to an end of a bike lane and you look around and say, yeah, well, what now? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where now? Or, or do I get out in traffic? Do I get up on the sidewalk? Do I get off my bike and walk for a mile? You know, it's, it is, it needs the connection, yeah. definitely. So beyond the bike lane, I think everybody can understand the idea of a bike lane that uh, something with a protected curb is more is better than a uh, you know some painted uh, arrows or pharaohs or on the on the road. I think you know that's coming, and of course it always is going to meet a certain amount of resistance from, from drivers who may lose or perceive that they're losing parking spaces uh, and or losing lanes, but. Are there other aspects of, of, uh, of infrastructure that people don't quite think of? And I'll tell you why I ask. I, again, I went to micromobility and I'm sitting talking to, actually they had the mayor of, of um, where, somewhere, uh, the mayor of Oakland, I think. And uh, is that Libby Schaff? I, I'll have to look that up. But anyway, she was saying, she was talking about how they were accommodating uh, scooters. And the biggest thing apparently that they could do to improve the scooter situation was require that when they're not in use, that they be locked up. 
And uh, I was sitting with a friend of mine who's a scooter guy and he said, yeah, easy to say, but you have to have a place to lock them up. Uh, so well, when you think of infrastructure uh, beyond the obvious or the, the, you know, the first line of, of, uh, of uh, the, the, the lanes and, and protected areas, what else do we need in, in infrastructure and the connections, which you mentioned? Yeah. What, yeah. else do we need? what else do we need? I definitely think, you know, you mentioned basically bike parking or, or you know, parking in general, secure bike parking. Um, thankfully, as we see more high rises and, and new buildings come up, there are, are laws that require additional bike infrastructure in those private buildings um, to accommodate for this. But even on you know, public streets, we do have a, a city bicycle coordinator who goes out and you know, installs bike racks in popular spots. So I think secure bike parking is an important thing so that you don't come back to just your front wheel or whatever it might be. Uh, Which I have sure that I experience yeah. I have <laughs> literally had. Yeah. So I think making sure that there's a, a safe way to lock your bike or leave your bike someplace, uh, that's, that's usually the, the second biggest, you know, once somebody's on there, they have that experience yeah. where their bike gets stolen or, uh, or where they, they just, you know, have a seat get stolen, anything like that. So I think um, bicycle parking, I mentioned earlier the, the, the showers and, and kind of experience at, at work. Um, and then really it's more of just like a, so long as there's, as, as the culture becomes more popular, where it's just normal to ride your bike places, I think we're going to really see that, that it kind of, the, the wave occurs, if you will, uh, that more and more people will, will come about. And that was really the, the question that when the bike share system, Vicky came in, it was a little bit of chicken or the egg. It's like, is there enough infrastructure to support the amount of, you know, bike users that we want to put out there? And then the question was, will there ever become enough infrastructure is, if there aren't a lot of bike riders? So ultimately, Vicky said, we're going to do this uh, and, and let's, let's make, it, make it count. And they, we, as you've seen, we've gotten more and more bike lanes since then. Yeah, that's been a tremendous chicken and egg story. Exactly. Because you can't have one without the other. And, and you get more safety when you have more people on bicycles. Uh, but you, if, if people don't feel safe, they won't get on bicycles. But as you look at this now, the increasing number of bicycles, the increasing number of e-bikes, I mean, you can get a $400 little e-bike at, at Costco or, or online uh, that will, you know, scoot you around town. Uh, there are more and more uh, one wheels and, and motorized skateboards, uh, electrified skateboards. How are we going to accommodate all of these different modes in what you described as kind of a limited area for, for this kind of transportation. Yeah, I, I mean, I think right now we're seeing kind of the sidewalks and the existing bike lanes really become the places that these individuals go. Um, and I, I think that's okay, so long as it's done safely and it's shared. But I do think ultimately, I hope that it leads to wider spaces, potentially, you know, a lane and a half or, or take that, bump that parking lane out one more so that we could have you know, uh, a much wider, so it's safe to pass, you know, overtake each other or anything like that. Um, so I do think it's, you know, we're seeing, as we see more and more people using these, I think we'll see less pushback, if you will, you know, the, there's just more individuals using it. Uh, so the people driving, there might be fewer of them. Uh, and there might be more people that are willing to advocate for the, the additional space of bike lanes and uh, widening of sidewalks and, and multi use paths and things like that. Um, and I think ultimately the real, the message there is just share the space. You know, it's, it's um, we've worked really hard as, as, you know, HBL and others to get these bike lanes, but I think ultimately we're very happy to just share them with, with other people using them, you know, in, in, a, in a one or two wheeled devices, you know, maybe not the delivery drivers that park in them all the time, but uh, we'll, we'll share them with the, uh, the micro mobility folks, no problem. Oh, that's, that's good. So you don't see a big come to blows between say the skateboarders and the e-scooter people and, and more traditional bicyclists? I, I don't necessarily see that. I, I think I see um, an education and etiquette, maybe etiquette that just needs to be developed as these new technologies become more popular. Just so, you know, when somebody's on a scooter or something that can go 20, 20 plus miles an hour and somebody's cruising on a, on a Bicky bike at eight miles an hour, you just got to you know, call out that you're going to pass them, give them space uh, and make sure that we just, you know, let, let everybody have, have a, a, a positive experience out there. Don't, don't ruin anybody's day just because you zip by them type of thing. All right. And, and, and let's hope that that's the, the coming reality. Uh -huh. um, 
because I know there there have have been some conflicts. Uh, uh, you know, there are some traditional cyclists who look down on e-bikes and so forth and so on. But uh, maybe we can do the Aloha Spirit and get over that. And you've got to remember when you look at Amsterdam or Copenhagen, these places didn't spring up one day and become bike friendly places. They were policy decisions and uh, people deciding to do it. And it's taken them 30, 40, 50 years to yep. become. And they still, of course, I'm sure there's, uh, you know, unfortunately accidents. I'm sure there, there are people that are cut off by cyclists, uh, but they've come to accommodate it over the course of many, many years. Yeah. So yeah. My, my big thing tends to be that, yeah. that we're all people. We're all people trying to move around. Uh, yeah, as much as possible, I try to use, you know, people first, pe uh, a person on a bike, a person on a scooter, just to remind everybody that, you know, as soon as I get off that device or whatever, like, we're all just people, and we're all trying to go the same places. Uh, and we want to make sure that we get there safely. And, and, you know, and there will be there, like you said, there will be crashes there. That's, that's, you know, ideally, we can minimize them and, and make them as least impactful as possible. But, you know, and with that, I think, it's just unfortunate growing pains and making sure that we have the space that's needed to, to accommodate all these users. And not forget there are growing pleasures as people ride more and are healthier and yeah. there is less congestion for drivers who are not fighting with quite so many cars. Yeah. Uh, so we got to, I think we're going to have to put our head down and get through a, a period of adjustment here. And that's kind of what this show is about and kind of what I, I'm hoping to talk to a lot of different people about. Yeah. So, um, this has been great. We're going to wrap up in a minute here. Uh, I want to thank you very much and invite you to come back anytime you want. And I will start bugging you for when you're going to come back for a future show. And we'll talk about more of this because we're certainly we're certainly not done. But one of the radio shows I listen to has a, a blank check question. Uh, and that goes like if, if uh, we could write you a check for not you personally, HBL. We could write HBL a check for a specific project, for a specific initiative, for something, uh, and you could have it have the check in your hand tomorrow and the project underway the day after that. What would it be? What would you do? Yeah. I think our biggest need right now is is greater um, direct advocacy, to, you know, uh, relations with the the policymakers and the decision makers. You know, we we used to have a full time advocacy position. Uh, and really right now we're, we're kind of, we have a couple part-time people that really focus on it, but we don't have as much uh, direct involvement as I think we could as this organization. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, our focuses are so broad that one blank check isn't gonna solve all of my, uh, all of my dreams. Uh, I think but, I was gonna sort of solve all your dreams. I want one dream that I can solve for you. I, I think greater involvement on the advocacy and policy side, just because I, I think people often uh, underestimate the, the impact that has in our day-to-day -day lives, um, whether it's, you know, infrastructure or uh, policies, directions, you know, things like that, that really do have a, a huge impact on kind of the underlying uh, networks around our, our lives. So I think we can make sure bikes are at the table or even just in general, micromobility, uh, non-vehicle moving around is at the table more often uh, in those conversations. And is HBL the vehicle for that or is it, uh, do we need some other or, or others uh, kind of pushing at the same door here? That's a good question. I think we have a lot of partners, you know, that, that work towards this, whether it's Blue Planet, whether it's Path on the Big Island, whether, so I think it's, it's a bit of a collective effort. Um, and HBL is one of the larger when it comes to bicycle focused nonprofits, uh, especially with staff uh, in Hawaii. So I do think we might be leading or at least uh you know helping to form that coalition maybe more than some others uh, but um you know i think using the using the tools and resources we have is probably a little easier than creating something brand new uh, but I, I i see a, a, a you know a collective being really the the way to get this accomplished and you have Biki, which is already partially semi quasi government collected, connected, however we would describe that. So yeah. that's great. Well, you got a new governor coming in, whoever it may be. Uh, you've got a, uh, a new house, uh, city council coming in. Uh, you've got a mayor who I don't think has really been, been tested on this. So I think there's a lot of room for that advocacy uh, role. And if it's done in the Aloha spirit, uh, and, you know, and, and I think that's, that's could, could be very influential in the coming years. So 
Uh, Travis, we're out of time. I want to thank you tremendously. I think the HBL is in very good hands. Uh, is considering your, your bio, I don't think they could have found anybody better. Uh, big shoes to fill with Lori, but fortunately she and you don't wear the same size so uh, or style. But uh, thank you very, very much. I will ask you to come back. Uh, thank you all for joining us. This has been the, uh, the Two Wheel Revolution, rolling with the Hawaii Bicycling League, new director, Travis, uh, Travis Council. I don't know if this is your first public uh, interview, but uh, certainly one of the early ones, and you've, you've really landed uh, on your feet here. So um, we'll be back in a couple of weeks with another discussion about micromobility. You can reach me at uh, the Two Wheel Revolution uh, at gmail.com. I'm open to your suggestions. You want to volunteer to be on a show? I'd love that too. And um, it's been a very interesting discussion for me. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.